Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for this time that you've given us while there is time to come together and feast together upon your word. We ask for your direction and your guidance you are our one teacher. Filter out all of that which is foolish. Seal to our hearts only that which is truth that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. There's a big difference between the doctrinal epistles, uh, which we've looked at in many of the Old Testament books. I'm sure you're aware of that. We have great lessons to learn, but what you know is biblical doctrine came from Romans through Thessalonians. I am not suggesting that uh, these doctrines are not alluded to in the Old Testament, but they're not developed. Paul, God used Paul to do that, and we have revelations that were never revealed before. For example, the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, never revealed before. So we try to go very carefully through the doctrinal epistles. I would like to look at Isaiah, given the time frame that we're in, given all that's going on. Chapter 17 uh, in this video. In chapter 16 through 23 of, of Isaiah, we have details that make it very clear that they are dealing with the nations that surround Israel. Many students of the word are always trying to figure out what these chapters mean. And there are two major approaches. One is to suggest that they deal primarily with the situation in Isaiah's time or a few years later, the problems that Israel had with Assyria and, and with Babylon and, and so forth. There's another approach. The other approach is that these are future passages of Scripture, and we don't really understand them in great detail. You know, somebody will someday, and uh, that's basically my view. I do not believe that we are looking primarily at prophecies that were fulfilled many, many times years ago in Isaiah's day or shortly thereafter. I am not suggesting in any way that they don't reflect some of the things that were present in Isaiah's day, but their primary message is a message that has not yet occurred. And that makes me, in some people's words, a futurist, or a historicist, or whatever word you want to use. What I'm not is I'm not a, a preterist. I do not believe all of these prof prophecies were fulfilled by A.D. 70. Now that, of course, doesn't mean that some weren't, but that's the position of this ministry. The fact that I believe one thing or another is really not very important. I just want you to know where I'm coming from as we approach these passages in Isaiah chapter 17. It's quite a familiar passage among uh, prophecy Bible students. I cannot, folks, I cannot allegorize all of these texts. And the only way anybody could make them fit fulfilled prophecy in past time is to al uh, allegorize what's been said. I'm not saying that there are not allegorical pictures in the scriptures, but I do not see that in Isaiah chapter 17. You know, one of the great miracles to me is that the creator of heaven and earth could even give me a book that I might even have a chance of understanding a sentence or two. It's, a, it's astounding. I wouldn't know how to write a book for kindergarten children. I wouldn't know how to do that. I find it amazing that God could write anything, really, that I could comprehend, but he did. 
And of course, we know we have our one teacher, the Holy Spirit, who brings to light the scriptures. Now, hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. Epistemology is the basis for what you believe. And you can have a, an allegorical hermeneutic. You can approach scripture and say, this means one thing, or you can take a literal historical approach to scripture, and that's what I do. There are 14 verses in chapter 17. I hope in this video to go over some of this. You, you'll be sorely disappointed if you came to this video expecting me to tell you when this is all going to take place. I can't go beyond what's written. Verse 1, the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. It's a verse that most Christians are probably familiar with, at least at this point. That's the capital of Assyria. Now, if we took look at this as being already fulfilled, we have a, a little bit of a problem because we can still go there today. Now, you could say, well, it was taken away from being a city in Isaiah's day. Well, it wasn't. Actually, it was taken over by another country, but the city's still there. No, Steve, Damascus was taken away from being a city, and it's a ruinous heap. No, it's not. Verse 2, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. I want you to remember that we have a divided kingdom. We have Judah and Israel, the ten tribes in the north, the two tribes in the south, and normally it's Judah, the two tribes, and Israel, the ten tribes. An actual fact we know from Scripture itself, as, as well as from history, that all 12 tribes were represented in Judah and in Israel. But be that as it may, the best terminology that we can use is the northern kingdom and, and Judah or the southern kingdom. So these cities are the northern kingdom. And as you know, Assyria and Syria were involved with Ephraim or with Israel. So these cities are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down and none shall make them afraid. I believe the picture of the first two verses is a picture of desolation. Desolation. Now, I recognize that you can go back through history and you can say there were periods when this appeared to be true in both Israel and Damascus, but not literally true. You can't say that those first two verses have ever been totally fulfilled. That's what many prophetic Bible teachers teach. And, and there is a near prophecy here of the devastation of the area of Syria and, and Ephraim as they go into captivity. And then there's a future fulfillment, one that has not yet been fulfilled. Now, I, I believe that there are passages of Scripture that have near and far fulfillments, but I'm not willing to say that that's, that's a, a general rule or that's a law of biblical prophecy. There are many who say that it is, there are surely cases where there's a near glimpse and a far glimpse in a passage of Scripture. I'm simply saying that, that I don't believe, if I'm to take this literally, that this has ever yet happened. So we are in the future. In the future. Verse 3. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. When did that happen? When did that happen? Do we know of any time 
biblically or historically where we could say we know what that third verse means. We do know that God has promised a remnant. And one of the first things people do is, is say the remnant is Israel. But we're told in the New Testament, even to this day, the remnant is according to the election of grace. And dearly beloved, the election of grace was not only for the church, the body of Christ, but to all of those who are the Lord's, all of them, the elect. Well, well, Steve, the elect, that's the body of Christ. No, no, that's everybody. Every, every one of God's children. The Lord said, and other sheep I have that are not of this fold, these also it behooveth me to bring, and my voice they will hear, and there shall become one flock, one flock, one shepherd. So he has another fold. The fold that he was talking about in John chapter 10 was Israel. And he says, I'm going to bring them in that there might be one flock. One flock. So there's several folds that make up the one flock. Or you, you could say uh, the Greek allows us to say there are other folds that make up the one flock. Now, I believe there's five. I've told this, I've mentioned this before. One would be the Old Testament saints before Israel, Adam to Abraham, and then Israel. Then the church, the tribulation period saints, some of, of which are martyred, some of which are not, but, but enter into, walk into the kingdom age alive. And then there are those born during the thousand year kingdom age. God has his own from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. I am not persuaded that that remnant is, first of all, always Israel or or secondly, always what we call the church. But one basic fundamental of a literal approach to the scriptures is, is that there is a significant difference, a, a definite difference. A, there is a sharp contrast between the nation Israel and the body of Christ. And I believe that the biggest problem with the, the preterist view that this was all feel, fulfilled in the past is Israel and the church. And it ought, ought to be because you really have to be sort of loose with scripture if you don't understand that dispensational distinction. I do not believe the kingdom was taken from Israel and given to the church, which is was basically what they call replacement theology. The church did not become some new and improved version, upgraded version of Israel. The church is unique and it, it, it is but one fold within Christ's one flock. I just want to be clear about that. So God has a remnant and I believe that when we stand in glory, we're going to be I'm utterly amazed that there are some from every nation kindred, tribe, and tongue. I believe he, he does because the work is his, not ours. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's Israel's enemy. And if you don't think that, that they're Israel's enemy today, you're not really keeping up with current events. Syria is Israel's enemy. And for the record, it is the single worst nation on earth as far as rankings go. It's worse on all levels, human rights abuses, everything. And, and by the way, Syria is 10% Christian. The remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Clearly, I'm not looking at anything that has taken place in human history, but I believe that we have every indication that God says when it's all said and done, the remnant of Syria is going to be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. 
Verse 4, And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. What day is that? And that's, that's a decision that you have to make. In that day. What day? When is that? I believe in that day is when God takes up his dealings with the nation Israel again. That's my conviction of what the text says. Verse 5. And it shall be as when the harvest man gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephim, verse 6, yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. It's going to be very great when God begins to deal with the nation Israel after the church age has closed. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. And a lot of people in Bible prophecy don't seem to want to recognize the terrible destruction that is coming on Israel. Folks, the city's going to be taken, the women ravished, houses destroyed, it's going to flee in a valley that God provides for. It's going to be a mess. Man, oh man, Steve, Israel just wiped out Gaza. They didn't. And they didn't wipe out Hezbollah or Iran or Sudan. They really didn't do much damage at all. And yet the popular opinion is these are God's people, man. They're going to just mess them up. They didn't. As far as Hamas goes, I don't know who you think won, but Israel sure didn't win. Hamas didn't win. But Israel didn't turn out to be the greatest victor that everybody seems to think. Dearly beloved, they are not the victors. If they were, they do not need Christ. If Israel can win its own battles, they don't need God. It's going to be devastating. The fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And so what is the picture in the sixth verse? You know, with a few olives up in there, you know, you shake the tree to get them. You know, that's the picture here. They're going to shake. That's what they will do to get those last few olives. They'll shake the tree and they'll fall out. And when they gather the ears, well, when you gather the ears, what's left? The stalk. So what we're looking at, in, I believe, in verses 5 and 6 is desolation. That's going to happen to Syria and Israel. We're talking about Ephraim here, or the northern area. There's deliverance coming, so don't give up on me here. All right, Verse 7, in that day, in that day, not at, Look at your text. It's not at, but in, says the Hebrew. In that day shall a man look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect, that reverence to the Holy One of Israel. In that day. A time period, not a 24-hour period. Now, when do you suppose that happened? Clearly, folks, we're, we're dealing with what people call un unfulfilled prophecy. I can't give you any clear detail. I've had ministers say that nobody, nobody can understand these chapters. Uh, 16 to 23 can't be understood. I'm not going to suggest to you that I understand in great detail, but I think it's clear what God is doing. When God gets done dealing with Israel and with the nations, they're going to look to their maker. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be converted. But man, they're going to recognize God and they shall know that He is God. Verse 8, And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, 
either the groves or the images. And it's easy to say that those people back then would carve out an image. Well, those Steve, those people back then, they'd carve out an image in a piece of wood or they'd chisel it out of a piece of stone and they'd fall down and they'd worship it. We'd never do that. Heavens, no. I, no, no. We worship land and job and stocks and bonds and beauty and, and who knows what. Anything but God. Why aren't they all idols? I have known too many Christians whose main trust is in their wealth rather than in the Lord. By the way, if you have much money, it ain't worth much. That's, but that's neither here nor there. They're not going to look at the things that they have made, the gods and the idols they're, they're worshiping. Oh, man, it, it's, it's wonderful. They will. What a wonderful revelation. They will trust him in that day. Verse 9. In that day, here we see the same frame. It's phrase used again. Not at that day. In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bough and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel and there shall be desolation. Desolation. Any number of people say that verse 9 speaks of the desolation that was rampant in the area of Israel over the dark ages, the, the times of the Crusades. Folks, I don't think that there's ever been a time when the desolation, like what is pictured here, took place. There have been, there have been long periods of time when Israel was out of the land now listen to me, listen to me, please listen. There were times when Israel was out of the land. They were suffering, they were in bondage, where that a multitude died, but there never has been the desolation that we see here. There's a spiritual application for the church there. I, I wish I could get into that, but I'll go on. The tribulation period deaths, folks, will equal 44 World War II's. I did the math. I see a picture of a terrible battle. Why? Why? Well, the text tells us. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. But listen dearly, but look, look at this. They forget him, yet he's still the God of their salvation. Amazing. Look at the, app, the life application here. Out of the land, we can be out of the land. Suffering, that's, that's what happens when we're estranged from our Lord. Not in fellowship. In bondage, that's law. Death, a terrible battle because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. And we know that what follows all of this is deliverance, salvation, because the God of Israel is our God. Isn't that fabulous? God will deliver us. God will deliver Israel. Verse 10, Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore, therefore, for this reason, shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shalt set it with strange slips. Let me translate that for you. Set out foreign seedlings. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion as to what those are. Uh, prophetic Bible teachers turn to that verse and say, you know, I know the fulfillment of that. They planted oranges in Israel, and there, there are actually articles written on that, and people get up and preach that. So, Steve, the strange slips, what that means is that there were never oranges in Israel in Christ's day, so they put these strange slips in there, and now Israel raises oranges. You know, folks, they don't raise very many oranges. You can go, you can go to Florida and see a hundred times more orange trees than you'll ever see in all of Israel. I don't think that's the fulfillment of that prophecy. 
Okay? They have forgotten the God of their deliverance. They haven't been mindful of the rock of their strength, but he still is. He still is. God has not forsaken the nation. Has God forsaken his people whom he foreknew? God forbid, we're told in the book of Romans. No matter what condition Israel was in, God was their deliverer and God was the rock of their strength. How Israel acted didn't change what God was. Okay? What he always was. They just weren't mindful of it. And I think many Christians walk through life absolutely unmindful of the fact that they're held in the hand of God. Dearly beloved, I don't know what he brings into your life, but he is the God of your deliverance and the rock of your strength. Those foreign seedlings, foreign is the word in, in the Hebrew. It's not native, it's foreign. Uh, now, if you take this literally, the Hebrew word or construction or the phrase, set it with strange slips, means plant foreign seedlings, you know, shoots, twigs, bulbs, etc. People that garden, you know what I'm talking about. Listen, dearly beloved, if we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. Oh, don't miss this. This is what Israel's done. Verse 11. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. Folks, we reap what we sow. All right? If we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. So what Israel's doing is not going to work. They're not going to do it. They are not going to do it. God is. You know, so that won't work for us either. The harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. We are basically looking at the result of endless unbelief. Foreign seed. Foreign seed. That's Israel's unbelief and ours. You know, foreign seed to me sounds like doctrinal error, the opposite of divine truth. We know one plants, one waters, but God causes the growth. But it, we got to be careful what we plant, folks. Verse 12. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Mighty waters. Uh, you can say, well, Steve, that's surely allegorical language. It is. But does, does that destroy the meaning at all? How else would the Holy Spirit picture it for us? The multitude of many peoples. Folks, Oklahoma, I'm, I'm, I'm in Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a land area of 68,000 square miles. The total area of the state of Israel is 8,000 square miles. That's, that's an interesting number, eight, okay? Now, you could fit 33 Israels inside the state of Texas. Israel's roughly the size of New Hampshire. And all nations come against her. Why? Because God drives them to her. On the mountains of Israel, you will fall, you and all your troops and the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals, says Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 4 and 5. In protecting Jerusalem, God will send a strong message to the world. I will make known my holy name among my people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned and the nations will know that I, the Lord, am the Holy One in Israel. Verse 7. God supernaturally intervenes. If we, if we look at Zechariah 14, 
I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Well, no need to do that. Israel's not that big. Why would all nations, dear folks, why would all nations go against Jerusalem to battle? There's only one reason. God drives them there. And this is what we're seeing today. And there's an application there for us as well, but we'll go on. I've pointed this out, well, on a number of times. If there's any picture of the sovereign God, it is that the whole world worries about what's, what, what happens in a little tiny place called Israel, which is one-eighth the size of Oklahoma. And I believe that the very time in which we live makes it apparent that God is pushing the world to this point. But he has not deserted the nation Israel. And it's because he has not abandoned Israel that we see this picture building rapidly. They're really coming like a tidal wave against Jerusalem. Verse 13, like the rushing of many waters. But God shall rebuke them. It's all just, just a with, with just a word. And they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Turn with me to Daniel. Uh, chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2 here. You all know the story, of course, an image with a head of gold, uh, the breast of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay. You all know that. What I want you to do is look at verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke into pieces together. That's all those nations. I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. That is all those nations. And thou saw the iron, the gold, broke into pieces together and became like the chaff, the, the chaff of the summer threshing floor. Let's go back to Isaiah. and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. I, th I think that it's the same point in time. Same point in time. Verse 14, last verse of the chapter. And behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. A dearly beloved, you may be one who is spoiled. You may be one who is robbed, but God is your God. The one who spoiled you or the one who robbed you will be like the chaff of the mountains before the wind. That's the portion of those who spoil us. I'm, I'm suggesting to you what's true of Israel is true of us. We have the same thing in Hebrews. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God has made it crystal clear that there's going to be somebody spoil you, somebody rob you. There, is not, there's, there isn't an indication in this verse that I'm preserved from that. The indication here is that I'm God's. Dearly beloved, you have a marvelous God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I would tremble to be in the place of those who tried to spoil or rob you. Does this have anything to do with the eclipse? Or does the eclipse have anything to do with Isaiah 17? I think the... The April 8 eclipse announced God's last day's judgment is about to fall upon all nations since Israel entered the final phase of its war for its existence. 
The eclipse coincided with Israel being at war. Symbolically, it crossed out the nations, plural. All nations, in my opinion. God has an overall plan and the Middle East conflict and the eclipse are not disassociated with, disconnected with these events. 9-11, anti-Israel protests, Trump, Biden, Netanyahu, Russia, Ukraine, both eclipses, the Revelation 12 sign, sexual revolution, gender identity, and so, so much more. China, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, all related. Palestinians, lawlessness, corruption, celestial wonders. Folks, it's all related. What we read here about the future is becoming a reality, and I want you to know that. And I also want you to know that we love you. We pray for you constantly. Rest in Him, the God of your salvation. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.